can the arts be used to not only give voice to the diversity of the present, but to also explore the broader story of America's history and the diversity that's integral to that story? Our next speaker is Associate Professor of Musicology at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, where he serves as Director of Research, Co-Director of the American Music Institute, and as Editor-in-Chief of the George and Ira Gershwin Critical Edition. Please welcome Mark Clegg. Just a thanks to the Sphinx and Aaron and Afa and everyone, Xavier, for putting this great meeting together and bringing us together in conversation. You know, they asked us to think about our topics in terms of issues and solutions. And in some ways, all of our issues and problems sort of boil down to the same issue and problem. That the, what we see around us, what we experience, is not what we're seeing and affirmed by our cultural structures, by our songs, by our institutions. Um, what John was talking about earlier with repertory and symphony orchestras is certainly a great example, right? If, if everyone's sort of white male European, 99% of our repertoire represents only one small part of this world, we're reinforcing and replicating a falsehood in a certain way. And so, what I, as a music historian, what I'm trying to do is to find ways to bring to my students the narratives that are often left out of the textbooks. And you know, these music textbooks that I'm using are the same ones that are reinforcing and replicating that canon of works that we're seeing in our concert halls. And so it's really that disconnect between the world we see around us, the world we experience, and then the world we replicate and represent in our symbols, in our concert programs, in the kind of art we put out there that we, we have an opportunity, I think, to start to advocate, to start to push back, to represent maybe the world around us a little bit more closely. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about. So for me, that, that solution has, is to use the arts to give voice to this diversity of the present, but also to recognize the diversity of the past that got us here. It's not just that we're embracing something that we're inventing in real time. It's rather that we're embracing something that's actually always been here, that we've either not paid attention to, that we've forgotten about, that the sort of power structures of culture of knowledge, of science, haven't brought back to our attention. So the history of African Americans in our country, certainly something that you know, pioneering scholars like Eileen Southern in music history have really sort of brought back. But still having that story come into our classrooms, into our concert halls, is still a challenge that we face. And so what I want to talk about today is, is one of these primary symbols that I think where the, the question of American identity, of who we are, is always present, and the ways in which by changing the, our memories of this, by telling a new story, that we can actually recover some of the sort of beautiful diversity of our own history, and then maybe put a new story in front of our future generations in front of us today, that may make it just a little bit easier to get along, which is sort of, I think, what we're all sort of aiming at. So, my project for really the last decade or so <laughs> has been the history of the U.S. National Anthem, which will celebrate its 200th birthday this September, September 14th, which is a Sunday. Um, I note that a lot of symphony orchestras play on Sundays, so maybe, maybe you can celebrate this event yourself in certain ways. Um, so we all probably know the basics of this story about Francis Scott Key being on, held prisoner on a British ship, about how he sees the flag the next morning after the bombardment of Fort McHenry and is inspired to write the text we now sing at every football game and sporting event and at the Olympics, which is happening right now. So it's this great sort of moment of pride. In fact, we actually rehearse a lot of mythology about the song. It's, he wasn't on board a British ship. He was aboard an American ship, his own ship, in fact. He wasn't really held prisoner. He was just sort of wasn't allowed to go until after the battle, but he had already been released, including Mr. Beans, who he had negotiated the release for. Um, lots of other little details about like where this, the melody comes from. The melody is actually written by somebody else entirely, a guy named John Stafford Smith. It's from London, from an amateur musicians club that was formed in 1775, 76, or that's when the song was written, rather. And then, you know, there's this sort of glorious history of how this, just one of many, many patriotic songs that was written at the time, um, becomes gradually to be associated with the flag and with a really American identity. So by the time of the Civil War, when there's this debate between North and South, 
or the future director of the, of the country, which is largely based on the legacy of slavery, right? Both the Confederacy and the Union are claiming all of the nation's symbols as their own, seeing themselves as really the only group that could project, protect the legacy of what makes America great. And so initially, the Confederacy claims the Star Spangled Banner. So they say, well, Francis Scott Key's a Southerner. You know, he's really one of ours. This is our song. You know, Washington was the first president, so this country, really, we need to protect these symbols from the North. The North is saying just the same thing from the other perspective, right? We need to hold things together. This represents the Union, so this song is ours. <clears throat> Fairly quickly, it becomes really more of the Union song than the Confederate song. Dixie sort of replaces um, the Star Spangled Banner as the anthem of the Confederacy. But this deepening of the relationship of our symbol to our sense of self is, is being ever reinscribed by repetition. And it's this repetition that is that sort of danger of the repertory issues we were talking about earlier, right? So if we're constantly just doing what we know, and we're doing what we know again, and then the next generation is learning what the last generation knew and is redoing that, then we end up just sort of you know, repeating ourselves, literally, and repeating who we are as well as what we're doing. Um, by World War I, the national anthem is becoming the national anthem. So before that time, um, it's not really treated as the official anthem of the country. Another song called Hail Columbia is sort of neck and neck with the Star Spangled Banner. Um, but President Wilson is the first to sort of have an executive order naming this the national anthem of the US military. And then um, 14 years later, the US Congress gets around to making official what basically cultural practice has already put into effect and names the song known as the Star Spangled Banner as the official anthem of the United States of America. What's interesting is that they can't at that time actually decide which version of the song is the official version. So there is, turns out there is no official version. And if we go back and study it, part of the reason is that the way they sang, the way Francis Scott Key sang it is very different from the way we sing it today. It was longer back then, it had an internal repeat, it was much faster, it was much more of a song of celebration over winning a battle than it was about um, a sort of sacred hymn, right? So we have this sort of iconic picture which was actually written for the, the 100th anniversary and I don't have to point out too hard the lack of diversity in that picture, right? That image of America that we're painting and celebrating um, is an image that's largely white, right? The, the sort of heavenly glow around the fort, the sort of heaven rescued land, the, the youth of America being represented, you know, there's no women in that picture, right? The, this, is, this is that replication we've been doing. As opposed to this history of performance, which is really quite diverse. And what I argue in my work is that every time we sing the banner, we, we make a statement about who is American, who, who has the right to be America, who, who is here, and what they sound like. And so the kind of you know, sort of dialect, if you will, that's in the song says a lot about who we are and starts to shift that notion. So when Jimi Hendrix picks up an electric guitar at Woodstock in 1969, it makes a profound statement about what this country is and who's allowed to be here and recognizing and endorsing that. So we need to sort of use the song and I think use the occasion of this anniversary as an opportunity to pull this off. So this reminds me, I'm going to steal this quote from Aaron that he used earlier. The danger of a single story is not that it's untrue. So it's not that most of the stuff we know about Francis Scott Key is untrue, but that it's incomplete. It turns out that what Francis Scott Key was doing is something that was quite common in the early part of the 19th century. It's called the broadside ballad tradition. It's where sort of lyricists and average citizens, I mean, Key is an amateur poet. He's morally more professionally as a lawyer. And this is his first poem that uses that same melody we now know as the Star Spangled Banner. It's from nine years earlier. It's called When the Warrior Returns, and it celebrated the um, success of Commodore Stephen um, Decatur, right? So this was an attempt to really put emotion to the news of the day, to really talk about the significance of what, it, what the news meant by attaching it to something that could convey feeling and passion rather than just reading in a newspaper what had happened. So that's sort of the, the practice that he was doing. And in my research, I've actually found several hundred different texts that use this same tune that we now know as our national anthem and that are sort of debating the direction of the country in really profound and interesting ways. So this is one of them. It's actually from Michigan. It was written in Battle Creek. It's called Oh Say Do You Hear. It's by E.A. Attlee. Um, and it's an abolitionist text that uses, as you can see, the, t the actual calls out the Star Spangled Banner in its title, but it presents a different vision for the country. And I'm, I'd like to welcome to the stage um, some of our students from the University of Michigan, John Bernard Sorin and Michael Sherman, to perform 
oh, say, can you, or say, do you hear?
passion shall live this child in a heaven rescued land there be shed by the slave in our blood guilty nation oh let us be just and in god we dare trust as the day we lord take us when perish we must and our stars colleagues at the University of Michigan. But the point I'm trying to make is that something so well known to us as the Star Spangled Banner, something so well known is really to be unknown. We don't actually know this history, this detail. That if we can recover some of this story about the struggle to become who we are, we can start to, I think, change our memory of the past and therefore change our future. So I think the challenge to us as cultural leaders as people who are putting these symbols in front of people. It's an incredible responsibility to make sure that these symbols are doing the work to bring us together, but to bring us together in productive ways that help us work together a little bit more successfully. So this mirror, the culture sort of puts up a mirror and my CD project is sort of one of these versions that we have versions that are in Spanish that date from the First World War. We have versions from Germany. Um, that are from the Civil War, that we recruit German immigrants into the Union Army, you know, and whereas now the immigration debate is such that if we tr sing this in any language other than English, every, there's an uproar, right? So we have to realize just how potent what we do is for our communities and make sure that we're using this to the advantage of our communities to bring us together. So thank you so much. So before we go to our last speaker of the day, a couple of notes. If you turn to the next page in your program um, past today, you will see that there is um, a, there are a couple of events happening this evening. We have uh, tickets available for tonight's Divine and Dvorak concert at 8 p.m. I believe those are discounted tickets available through the DSO. Uh, we also have an event this evening, Toast and Jam, at 1030 at 42 degrees north. It's the bar that's just across the hall west of the Marriott lobby, and will be joined by those involved in the Sphinx competition. Sphinx Con, of course, is, is invited to come, and we'll have a special guest. It, uh, is, he's a Knight Arts recipient, a Kresge Fellow, and founder of Hardcore Detroit, Halim Rasul. So that's available for you this evening as well. So our last speaker of the day is a Latin Grammy and Grammy winner. She's had nominations as both composer and pianist. She says composers can act as musical ambassadors. Her music is regularly commissioned and performed by artists such as Yo-Yo Ma, Don Upshaw, the King Singers, and the Kronos Quartet, as well as major orchestras of the US, including those of Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, and Atlanta. Please welcome American pianist and composer, Gabriella Frank. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. This is my first time at a SphinxCon event, and I don't know what the hell has been taking me so long to get my butt over here, but I have to say that over the last day and a half, I have revamped completely what I thought I was going to be doing for you guys. So inspired that I have been by all the fine minds that have been sharing their ideas about what it means to be a proponent of diversity in the arts. And I was thinking about what it is that somebody like myself, a freelance, active, working composer can bring to the table to contribute. Those of us that are of color, I'm a woman, I'm disabled too, haven't been born with a neurosensory hearing loss, I'm only a few percentage points away from being profoundly deaf. We're a phenomenon for just existing. 
but how can our experiences as artists, as witnesses to what it means to be a human being, how can these be codified in a piece of music? Now, I know all of you guys are very seasoned listeners. I know you listen to a lot of interesting programs, and you see amazing performers, and you hear really great works of art. But you see finished products, and I thought what I could do would be to allow you a bit of an x-ray vision into the creative process, at least my creative process. What goes into the creation of a piece of music that proposes is going to unify, say, idioms from a Western classical canon with those from a non-Western canon. So let's suppose that I have a commission and I need to write a short solo piano work, which is convenient given the instrument that I can work with today. One of the first things that I will do as a composer is I will draw on the knowledge that I have on styles that I have studied for many years. Some of these are styles that I grew up listening to and others are, are styles that I brought into my toolkit years later. And I can begin with just hard facts of what I know. So in order to write a solo piano work, I can begin with, say, the idea that I wanted to be inspired by a musical culture of the highest body of fresh water in the world, which would be a lago Titicaca. I love saying that, Titicaca. And this is the great lake that's between Bolivia and Peru. There are distinct indigenous cultures with distinct art and music. And I know that the typical rhythm of music that is associated with water, whether you're talking about Vietnamese boating songs or a Viennese boating song or a mariner's ballad from Lake Nicaragua, there is a rhythm that we always associate with water. And I can just start with that. And that rhythm is dum, ba bum, bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum, bum. It's, it's got that rocking rhythm to it. And then I can take it a step further and I can say, OK, for actual pitches that I perhaps could graft onto that rhythm, why do I use an instrument that is typical of all Latin American music that we certainly find in El Lago, in the lake? And that would be the Spanish guitar. The open strings of the guitar, you will probably know, the six strings are. And so it would be a very simple matter to graft those notes on to that boating rhythm. Not very difficult. I'm playing it like a pianist, though, and pianos are not plentiful around El Lago Titicaca. You will find guitars, and so I must play it like a guitarist who would probably strum that highest note. And maybe they strum the other direction. And they wouldn't just strum once or twice, they would enervate it a bit. a typical technique of the piano vocabulary, but that's one of the great things that we get to do as composers. We get to break the rules. We get to tr treat this as nothing but a sound machine. That with this instrument, I can take you to any country if I have the skill to do so. So we have a pretty good start. I know that guitars have more than one chord at their disposal. So if I were to move this around to some other harmonies, it might sound something like. pretty good vamp. We don't have a melody yet. In order to do a melody, you notice that it took me two hands to just play this vamp. So I can't suddenly grow a third hand. And I'll share a secret with you. A lot of composing is smoke and mirrors. We have to learn as composers is how to shift our resources around. And so if I make a one-handed version of this, you're not going to notice that the, that the music became anemic in any way because I'm going to distract you with the introduction of a new event, which is the melody in the hand that gets freed up. So that might sound something like this.
close it to something that could be a typical song from El Lago. It still sounds to me like I have a guitar in one hand and a piano in the other hand. This is still sounding like a pianist to me. So what I can do with my right hand is bring in another effect, one effect that I love and I use in a lot of my music. And that is simply repeating the note. What it does for the piano, it keeps it alive because the piano is always a decaying instrument. As soon as we play the note, it doesn't sustain, you know? But I can convey the illusion of that by simply playing it again. You see this effect in charango music, which is our ukulele of the Andes. You see it in different kinds of flutes that da -da 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 -da, that really uh, gradate the, a rapid repeated note technique. So if we were to do that, it might sound something like. I think this is getting to the point where I might be fulfilling that piano commission. If I change my mind and I no longer wish to stay in the water, let's say we want to go onto the shores of Peru. So the southern part of Peru is a region that I really love visiting. It's uh, Puno. And Puno is known for its Diablicos Puneños, or the devil dancers. And the devil dancers, they have this repeated note technique. So that's the one idea I'm going to take away from the lake. I'm going to bring it onto the shores. In order to get it stylistically correct and to have an element of something that's more ominous, I may take that. I'm going to sink the pitch. I'm going to make it a little lower. And the former accompaniment, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. I'm going to simplify it so I don't have that roll. Maybe I'll make it more dissonant. And I'm going to bring back that repeated note, but something that's a little lower. And I also know that this is a culture known for its drums. So the typical drum rhythm from, from the shores of Puno. So it's a little uneven. There's a little bit of a da 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 dum dum when they're hitting the edge. So if I were to unite those forces and the changes, it might be something like this. has much more of a character, oh, thank you, that has much more of the character that, that Diablicos Puneños, that some of my uncles actually dance, I really have to get this right, would, would, would carry. If we were to take that repeated note technique and go up the coast, perhaps to the area where my mother is from. She's from a beautiful town, a fishing village known as Chimbote. And they are known for their pinquillo flute. So instead of being down here, will be up here. And instead of squeezing in as many repeated notes as I can, it's actually regulated into groups of two or four or three with an insistent accompaniment, but that's also up high. to Venezuela. Venezuela has these beautiful llanos. These are the grassy highlands. And the quintessential instrument of the llanos is the Venezuelan harp. These are homemade instruments. Some of them have a lot of reverb, but they're actually kind of dry sounding. And they have short staccato phrases that are emphasized with dissonant notes, in which I'll carry in my left hand, and repeated notes that stop and start. 
Then if we were to slow this down even more. Now we're going over to Colombia. Colombia, there's a race of Indians known as the Kuli. And they will play just one note in a group of four men. So we need to add in some guys. There's our third guy. We have our quartet. stick with these notes, very few changes in the pitch, but the dynamic shape might change. And they peel away. And what if we peeled away everything where all we had was the repeated note with just the barest of accompaniment? This could be anywhere in Latin America, maybe a fantasy Latin America. power of just one repeated note that can take you all around Latin America. This is how one can reconcile idioms from different cultures. And you can, as you can probably tell, I love my job. And I've been loving my job since the time I was a little girl when I did a modified version of this, uniting Clemente and Haydn with the charango effect. And my piano teacher didn't scold me for improving upon back with, with, with these effects. And you know, as I've gotten older and have really navigated the minefield of what it means to bring up these cultural issues. It's something that's important for me to understand how universality really does come in through diversity. And that every which way that we are different is a, is a responsibility that we inherit to put that message out there and to do so not necessarily from a place of anger or a place of moralizing, but one of joy where as a creative artist, I hope that my audiences and my, my musicians get high off of my high 
that when I'm along for the journey and I get to discover a new part of Peru, that I feel like I can share this as a gesture of hospitality. I have been feeling extremely inspired by the last day and a half, and I hope that we can end today on a really nice note. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you, Gabriella. If I, I do have a question for you, if you don't mind coming back. She <laughs> snuck off so fast. I find it interesting that you are able to so clearly explain mm -hmm. your process. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, is that something you've developed, or has it been necessary to find a way to tell people mm -hmm. how you do what you do? Mm -hmm. um, I think I always was chatty, you know. Um, <laughs> And I think my family would tell you that also. Um, but I have absolutely found it necessary to be able to be articulate about it. I think this is something that was visited upon me when I was a student. And uh, to always be in a position of explaining. And I remember when I first did it, I did it from a, perhaps a place that was somewhat defensive. Because I didn't have all the answers yet. And I, you know, I've been very blessed to receive really great attention from the concert world. And with that attention comes responsibility. And it's something that I will impress very hard upon young composers that I mentor. That, you know, this is, you're in the business of putting it out there. And people define Latin American culture by what I do. And if I get something wrong, however that definition may lay, it's, it's spread out there. Yeah. Spread out there. So it, it means, you know, being able to be articulate, but also being able to mine from an idiom that exists but not do a slavish imitation of it. You're trying to show how this is not something that belongs in a museum. It's also not something that's only to be programmed in Latin American concerts. Uh, for that reason, I'm very sensitive to um, writing works that may have names like Sonata Andina, Andean Sonata, that tell you right away the level, the bar that I'm going for. And along with that, it's the awareness you know, you're touching on. This is being able to be articulate about the process or philosophically what it means to be a musical journalist of some sort, a, a storyteller. But we need to do this, I still believe, from a, a place of joy. So when you're articulate, if you can show, if you can get into the moment of, yes, I'm creative. You know, and our responsibility comes first on a, on a creative bent, then I feel like, this is a skill that all composers need to be aware of. Musically, uh, for you, what do you still want to explore? Well, God, that bucket list is so long. <laughs> um, I have recently begun to do more work in, with indigenous musicians themselves. And this has, ironically, came through the Silk Road project a few years ago under the direction of Yo-Yo Ma. I have a great-grandfather who's Chinese. And so I have a lot of things in me. And when I travel in Latin America, I am Gabriela, Gabriela, which is Spanish. Lena is my Lithuanian Jewish grandmother. Frank is what they gave us coming over Ellis Island. Come, which is Cantonese. And they didn't know that I had any Chinese heritage in me, but my first time writing for non-Western instruments was uh, the Chinese pipa and the Chinese shang, and I was sweating bullets. But it was just like learning how to write for the violin the first time. And so in more recent times, I have been getting to know uh, more indigenous musicians from El Lago Titicaca, you know, from who play the Venezuelan harp and that are dying for repertoire from a completely different ethnic, racial, nationalistic standpoint. And as somebody that was born here, my mom likes to say that I'm Latina and she's Latin Americana. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference. There is a real difference. I'm very proud to be American. I'm so patriotic, but it may not be the kind of patriotism that is defined by, by others. So it's, that has been something that's on my composing plate now, is how to compose music that is sophisticated and unites all the skills that I have and uh, skills that I don't have, but I will have when I leave that piece. But for now, uniting either the indigenous musicians with classical musicians and seeing what happens, because mm -hmm. uh, there are cultural norms that I have to reconcile. For instance, what might be considered bad intonation is not on either side. What might be considered a, a, a terrible way to end a phrase, maybe blowing towards the end and changing the color, and, and it's, it's a panpipe effect from the Andes because they're trying to <laughs> excel, get all the air out so they can take a really big breath, so they can engage this rough instrument. 
But in classical music, where all the singers are taught to phrase off, we're taught to get off that bow really clean. So when I put accent on the end of my phrases for my string quartet, the players are so shy. They're so shy, I'm like, no, really, really go for it. So these are, you know, these are things that are very interesting to me and I would like to explore ever more. I don't think it's just in the immediate future. I think I'll always be like Bartok, you know, always never done with ideas. My last question, when you are working with indigenous musicians, what do you think you leave with them? I, I can hear what you take, but what do you, what do you give? You know, and this holds true for classical musicians too, you know, not just indigenous, although there might be an extra awareness of my coming in as maybe the um, somewhat intimidating American you know, with, a, with a Frank as my last name, Dr. Frank. And, but it's basically the same process, which is you go in with a sense of humility first, you know, and that um, ideally I always feel like before I write for an instrument, I should play it very well. But since that's never going to happen, uh, I need your pearls of wisdom to help me out. There's, there's, it's, a, it's very old school that it's an oral tradition at heart, even though we're fixated on the score. Composers, we get it on the score, it's like, done? Uh, no, it's not done. <laughs> you laid out some instructions that should change and be really fluid. So I will go in usually and in the hope that after having played my music, that it is music that is worthy of its longevity because musicians never forget anything that they learn. It may fade a little bit, but any musician will tell you that when we get back into the instrument and we start playing, the fingers start finding it for us. We don't know where it's coming from, but it just never really left. And I know that I will leave that kind of impression on somebody and they'll take a little bit on that and the stamp will be on every other piece that they play after. So if they play Beethoven, Beethoven's got a little gap in him now, you know, in, in that. And it really is, it really is like that. So I, you know, I always hope that I'm not wasting anybody's time. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gabriella yeah. Frank. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps up our sessions for the day. Again, reminders, there is the DSO concert, Dvorak, Divine and Dvorak, also Toast and Jam tonight at 1030 here in the Renaissance Center. All the information is in your program. Thank you so much for being here today. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9. Have a great evening. <laughs>